OK, so um, I'm going to talk about ADS3 CFT2, um, sp specifically uh, CFT in two dimensions. Um, so let me start with a few words of introduction, which I think are, are somewhat general, um, and then we'll move to two dimensions. I suspect that you've heard these things before, but um, now we're all going to cook. OK. OK, so I suspect you've heard many of these things before, uh, but this will help me plot where we're going. So uh, we know that ADS is dual to CFT, but there are many things that we don't know. And uh, I want to keep track of what they are. OK, so um, we don't know in detail how these two theories are dual to each other. That is, uh, we know that it works. We know that you could do calculations on the two sides and get the same answer. Uh, but we can't derive it. Uh, we don't understand in detail why or, why or which strongly coupled quantum field theories reorganize themselves into an emergent geometry. Uh, so to answer this, we would have to derive gravity We would have to, in particular, derive Einstein gravity, uh, which is root g times r plus small corrections, uh, not some other theory of gravity that was also diff invariant but had large higher curvature terms. Question two, we don't know when. When is CFT uh, dual to ADS? Um, we don't know the, let me move this. We don't know the universality class of CFTs, uh, which uh, in some limit give you Einstein an emergent Einstein gravity. So I'll focus a lot on this word universality in these lectures and uh, explain in detail what specifically I mean by this word. Uh, for now, it just means that there are lots of theories that give the same answers to many questions at leading order. That is, questions like, what is the entropy? Well, it's the area of some black hole. That doesn't depend uh, on exactly what holographic theory you talk about. Uh, it's something, it's some sort of coarse grain feature that's universal to a large class of theories. We don't understand, related to this on the gravity side, we don't understand what landscape of quantum gravities we're really talking about here, and in particular, whether strings play an essential role, um, whether they're unique or when they're unique or required. And these are the kinds of questions that we would like ADS-CFT uh, to be able to answer. Since we're doing pretty well with the question words, uh, we're going to make the next one where. OK, we don't know uh, exactly where ADS CFT is working. What I mean by that is we don't understand locality in detail. We have major difficulty with questions about black hole interiors, information paradoxes, finite regions of space-time, and uh, flat space-time, especially. And um, I'll add a number four catch-all. Uh, we don't even know if these are necessarily the right questions we're supposed to be asking of ADS-CFT in the bootstrap. Uh, maybe there are other questions. Where else can we go with this? Um, where can we go with quantum gravity and strongly coupled field theory from this starting point? Um, we'll see. OK, so, um, so where do things stand? Well, I want to motivate two dimensions, two-dimensional CFT, that is, three-dimensional gravity. And uh, well, basically, um, I think that two-dimensional CFT or 3D gravity is a great place to try to answer a lot of these questions. 
uh, because it's a place where we can do lots of explicit calculations that we can't do in higher dimensions. It's a place where a lot of the technical difficulty that you have in higher dimensions is taken care of for you by the Virasoro algebra, but in a way that doesn't throw away the good physics. So uh, I might say that d less than 2 gravity is too special. d greater than 3 is in some ways too hard, although we can make lots of progress there too. Uh, and that d equals 3 is the ideal place uh, to answer a lot of these questions. So why too special? In two, dimension, in, in two dimensions, uh, there are theories that we can solve exactly, uh, but they seem to, the answers to a lot of these questions seem to be different in two dimensions. Um, a lot of these things have been answered in the last few, year, few years with the revival of, of ADS2 and the SYK model, things like that, uh, but um, things are just different. So ADS2 can't really have finite energy excitations, uh, black holes in, in two dimensions seem to lose information. Uh, there, there are just qualitative differences, and we won't necessarily learn anything about higher dimensions by studying 2D. Higher dimensions, we have to worry about the, we have to deal with the full complication of nonlinear uh, Einstein gravity in higher dimensions. That's hard. Three dimensions is ideal because the number of graviton degrees of freedom, which is in general a half d, d minus 3, is equal to 0 in three dimensions. Okay, so this is a, uh, viewed as, as a quantum field theory. Uh, this is a theory with zero local uh, degrees of freedom. So you might wonder if it's just completely trivial. Uh, maybe this one uh, is too easy. Well, that's not the case, because although it doesn't have any local degrees of freedom, uh, it does have, it does have non-trivial physics, it does have non-trivial dynamics, it has non-local degrees of freedom. So there do exist, so uh, no local degrees of freedom, but there do exist black holes and all of the associated paradox that come along with that, things like Hawking's paradox, uh, Maldacena's version of the information paradox, the firewall paradox, the problems with black hole interiors. These all exist in three-dimensional gravity. And as far as we know, uh, should be, or I would say uh, even stronger than that, there are good very good reasons to believe that the, so the answers to these questions in three dimensions are the same as in higher dimensions. So how are we doing? Uh, on these questions. Maybe I'll um, give us some, some grades and, and then tell you where we're going to focus in these lectures. So in 3D, um, I'm going to give us about a B plus here. Okay, so, they're, they're, so gravity has, has zero degrees of freedom, but as I said, we still have to be able to derive uh, things like black holes, black hole entropy, uh, all that sort of stuff, we could do pretty well. And we can understand, uh, to some extent, why it's universal. I'll give us a B minus for universality. OK, so uh, I'll discuss some examples in this lecture, uh, or maybe, maybe next time, uh, where we can say very precisely what is meant by the universality class of holographic CFTs. We can define it. Uh, we can say what the, what the ne necessary and sufficient conditions are. Uh, but that's just one special example. This kind of stuff, we're not doing so hot, maybe. Um, I mean, I, I, in my notes, I gave us a D minus here. OK, maybe, maybe for, for information paradox, I'll upgrade it to a C uh, for, for reasons that I'll discuss, hopefully, towards the end of these lectures. So uh, what I want to focus on. These are American grades. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, this one, this one might be this one might be great inflation. Yeah, exactly. We didn't get any A's. Um, okay, so so 
I want to, what, I, what I want to tell you about mostly is the stuff that we do understand, so I want to, tell, I want to focus on, on sort of the Bs here, uh, and to what extent we can derive gravity as a universal low energy phenomenon in some class of theories. I'll come back and talk about the information paradox um, in probably the third lecture. Okay. Um, before we get started, let me encourage people to ask questions uh, as we go. Please do stop me, um, especially if you can't hear me. <laughs> I can put the microphone back on, um, but okay. So. So roughly speaking, our goal in these lectures to sh is to show that any 2D CFT satisfying two simple conditions is holographic. The first condition is that the central charge C is much bigger than 1. So you can think of this as a large n condition. This is measure of the no C, central charge C is a measure of a number of degrees of freedom. Uh, it shows up in the free energy, as we'll see, uh, and is necessary to have a semi-classical holographic description. And condition two is what I'll call sparse spectrum. In words, uh, this is the statement that there are not too many operators with low scaling dimension. That is delta less than about less than something of order C. So the goal is to show, uh, is to get as far as we can with the conjecture or claim uh, that any 2D CFT with these two properties, regardless of the microscopic details, regardless of uh, the Lagrangian, uh, is secretly a theory of 3D gravity. And to understand how to calculate the geometric gravity-like observables in this class of theories. Yeah, good. So, um, okay, sure. Okay, so the question is, uh, what do you mean by not too many operators? And the answer um, is that I'm not going to tell you yet. Uh, I'll give you a precise definition in certain cases, but a totally general definition of, of what's what's meant by this is not is not known is an important open question. To be clear, uh, when I say 3D gravity, I'm not talking about pure gravity. I'm talking about 3D gravity coupled to interesting stuff, matter, matter fields, particles, strings, et cetera. Um, so pure gravity is a topological theory. Remember, this is, the gra this is the theory with zero degrees of freedom. It's a topological theory that, w that may or may not exist as a quantum theory. Uh, that's an interesting question, but it's not uh, one that we're talking about here, we're really talking about um, real 3D gravity, 3D gravi gravity coupled to stuff. Um, so the kinds of things you can get by compactifying string theory down to three dimensions. Let me give you a couple references uh, that you can look up many of the things that I'll talk about. So there are notes on my homepage from a course that I taught. And in these lectures, I'll especially cover sections 4 and 23 to 26. Um, so if you search my name in quantum gravity lectures, then uh, that should come up. Okay, so 
uh, the first in the first part, uh, which I guess will be probably two lectures, I'm going to talk about the spectrum. There are roughly uh, two things that you might want to know about a quantum field theory or a theory of gravity. One is the spectrum, and the other is the correlation functions. Um, so that's part one and uh, part two. We're going to start with the spectrum of the Hamiltonian. Uh, there we can discuss things like black holes, black hole entropy, uh, thermodynamics, phase transitions, and so on. We'll start on the CFT side. So spectrum and thermodynamics of 2D conformal field theory. So I want to describe some basic features of the spectrum of a 2D CFT, a partition function, and modular invariance. Consider a two-dimensional quantum field theory. So at this point, uh, I'm not yet assuming conformal invariance. We'll come to conformal invariance later, but I want to go as far as I can without it. On a S1 of length L times time at temperature T is 1 over beta. Then, as usual, we define the partition function, z of beta, to be the trace for e to the minus beta h that captures the spectrum of the Hamiltonian. I'm putting in this L here to keep track of the fact that we're talking about the theory on an S1 of size L. So maybe over here, I should, I should keep track of it there, too, that we're tracing over the spectrum of the theory on a circle of size L. And really, there's an L up in, up in this Hamiltonian as well. So this is the sum over states on S1L of e to the minus beta times the energy in the quantum field theory on S1L. So I'm going to be going back and forth in these lectures between Euclidean and Lorentzian uh, methods and, and calculations. So I want to try to be clear which is which. So I have a question uh, for the audience, which is, am I talking about the Euclidean theory or the Lorentzian theory at this point? This, is, this gets confusing. I just wrote the partition function. Am I talking about the Lorentzian? Am I talking, is this a Euclidean discussion or a Lorentzian discussion? Louder? Shout it out. I hear Euclidean. Any other? I hear that I hear it's the same. Any, any, oh, there's one other. Okay. <laughs> okay. So exactly. So neither. No, okay. So at this point, um, the answer is is neither one. We're talking about the spectrum um, on S1. Okay. It's a two-dimensional theory. And when you talk about about the partition function, um, there it's it's tempting to talk it's tempting to talk about the theory on a torus. But that doesn't make any sense. OK, so when you, when you talk about the theory, you talk about space. What do we do when we find it? If you write down the Lagrangian, what do we do when we find a Hilbert space? We, impose boundary, we, we choose a space. We, we impose boundary conditions on that space. And then we talk about the spectrum of states on that space. It's not a question of space time. So uh, this is both, uh, either one. 
if we're talking about the Euclidean theory, um, then so Euclidean versus Lorentzian is a matter of how you evolve those states. You, know, you define a state in the theory, and if you, de if you evolve it with e to the minus h tau, then you're talking about a state, then you're talking about a Euclidean calculation. If you take that state and you evolve it by e to the iht, uh, then you're talking about a Lorentzian calculation. But uh, the spectrum is the same. At this point, we don't have to say and shouldn't say whether we're talking about one or the other. But we can compute it with a Euclidean path integral. So this is a standard calculation, which I'll just write down quickly. Trace of e to the minus beta h is the sum over states of n e to the minus beta h n. Now that I've forgotten that I'm, a, that I'm supposed to shout, can people still hear me? We're still doing OK? Don't, or should I put on the microphone? Good? OK. Maybe I didn't forget. So writing this transition amplitude as a path integral, uh, we have a sum over n of a path integral cut on two ends from the state n at the bottom to the state n at the top, and evolved by a distance beta. So all I've done is I've taken that last equation over there and used the usual um, translation between path integrals and operators. And the point is that the trace just glues the top to the bottom. So if we have n on the bottom and n on the top, we sum over n, well, we might as well just have a circle. So this is the path integral on the torus. which has one circle of size L and another circle of size beta. I guess I should have been writing here that the space direction here was always an S1 of size L. And now the trace is just glued together the top and bottom. So we're just taking that operator statement and turning it into a statement about the fields that appear in the path integral. Questions so far? Similarly, uh, we can cut, we can invert this proce procedure. That is, we can cut the path integral. To invert this, if we start with the path integral on the torus, that is, we just stick the Lagrangian in there, impose periodic boundary conditions, and do the integral, so we have the path integral on periodically identified with size beta and L, 
uh, we can insert a complete set of states into this path integral by cutting it at the top and bottom. And this becomes sum over n. of transition amplitudes from n to n, where this sum is over states in the Hilbert space on the S1 of size L. OK, I realize I'm going through this sort of slow, but I want to be careful um, so that we can say exactly what's going to happen in CFT. What's the difference between what you wrote on the left and the right of that line? Um, yeah, I, I put it in the other order. I, I'm just saying that we can, given the, no, that's fine, yeah. I'm just saying that we can translate back and forth between path integrals and operator statements um, by pretty much the usual statement of the path integral as a transition amplitude, that's all. And uh, the reason I wrote this is because I want to say that we can also cut sideways. Uh, that is, starting from this path integral on the torus, we could, we could cut it at the top and bottom to go backwards, back to our original statement of the, of the partition function. Uh, but we're, at this point, we're just summing over quantum fields with periodic boundary conditions. And we're free to cut it uh, the other way uh, instead. So if we cut this picture sideways, um, that is, we think of this z torus as the sum, sum over, let me call it n prime, over a transition amplitude from n prime to n prime, now where we have L going this way, beta going that way, and written as a uh, trace, What we've done is taken the path integral on the torus and interpreted that same path integral two different ways. So if we cut it in the usual way, it turns into the usual thermal trace. If we cut it the other way, uh, it just swaps beta and L. So the conclusion is that the trace over the Hilbert space on S1L e to the minus beta h is equal to the trace on the Hilbert space S1 beta of e to the minus L h. Yeah, different H's, that's right. So um, in path integral language, this is completely obvious. I, I, should, I should say again here that I'm not talking about conformal field theory. So you've, I'm sure you've, you've seen statements like this before. Um, I'm about to get to conformal field theory. We haven't gotten there yet. We haven't used conformal invariance. All we've used is locality. OK, so when we, you know, when we often talk about doing conformal field theory and doing bootstrap because we don't need a Lagrangian, here I am writing path integrals as if we had a Lagrangian. And what I'm doing uh, secretly when I write a path integral is invoking locality. Now, the fact that the path integral is the integral of a local Lagrangian uh, is very powerful, even if you can't say what that Lagrangian is. So what we're doing is we're invoking locality um, to make a statement about the spectrum. In terms of the path integral, this statement is completely obvious. But in terms of the spectrum of these two theories, uh, it's not, it doesn't look uh, obvious at all. It's some very non-trivial consequence of locality. So this was any quantum field theory. But 
uh, generally, it relates to different theories. If you take a massive theory and you put it on a circle of one size, and then you put the same Lagrangian on a circle of a different size, that's a very different theory. The spectrum of those two theories uh, could be completely different. And that's the kind of thing that can happen here if we're talking about a massive theory. It's still true, uh, but it's not relating a theory to itself. It's relating to different theories. Uh, the advantage of CFT is that scale invariance tells us that uh, only L times the only thing that actually matters in a CFT, a two dimensional CFT at finite temperature. Uh, since there are no other mass scales around, the only thing that matters is the dimensionless combination length times temperature. So the only length times temperature matters. i.e. energy levels en are functions only of the combination beta over l. In terms of the partition function, this means that we can just rescale both of these parameters, L. Sorry? Do you really want to, I'm confused. Do you want to really say that the energy is a function of beta over L? I don't think so. You want to say that the energy is 1 over L times delta N. No? <laughs> um, Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. OK. Um, but in terms of the partition function, the statement is that the partition function is only a function of beta rel. Um, so we can rescale it. Z, if we rescale L and beta together, uh, then nothing changes. And um, that means we can turn this identity on the traces into a statement about a single theory. That is, we can always rescale to L equals 2 pi. And um, applying that over here, so, so usually when we write z of beta in a conformal field theory, uh, we mean, so this is defined to be z L equals 2 pi, uh, because we like to define states on the unit circle. And um, so translating or applying this formula over here, now we can swap beta and L. So we get z sub beta at temperature 2 pi. So the first line is just a definition. The second line is swapping L and beta. Now I'm going to apply this scale symmetry so that this is z. I'm going to apply the scale symmetry to set the radius to 2 pi. So this is beta times 2 pi over beta, which is 2 pi. At 2 pi times 2 pi over beta. So the conclusion that is in CFT, z of beta is equal to z of 4, four pi squared over beta, where I've eliminated the subscripts because now we're always talking about the theory on the, on the unit circle. 
So this is modular invariance. And um, the point is that in CFT, we have the same theory on the two sides of this equation. This is not relating two different, two different things. This is now a constraint on the spectrum uh, of a single CFT, of a single theory, one uh, set of eigenvalues. Secondly, it's clear from this formula that just like the crossing equation uh, in the conformal bootstrap, this relates ultraviolet to infrared. In particular, what I mean is that it, if you write the density of states rho of E, then uh, this will tell you this is inverting the temperature. So in some vague, rough kind of way, it's telling you that the density of states at high energies is fixed in terms of the density of states at low energies. I say it's in a vague way uh, because, um, just as always in the bootstrap, you really have to do the whole sum. Uh, but there will be specific ways in which it precisely um, fixes the UV in, in terms of the infrared. So I tried to emphasize in the derivation that this was really coming from two fundamental properties of the theory. Um, first, locality. That allowed us, to, allowed us to swap the two cycles. And then scale invariance, which allowed us to take the two sides and, and write them in the same theory. You can repeat all this with an angular potential. And the story is pretty much the same. The only difference is that at some point in the derivation, you also have to use a rotation. And what you end up with is that the formula is identical, except that beta is now a complex number whose real part uh, is the temperature, inverse temperature, and imaginary part is the angular potential. Um, and it transforms as tau goes to minus 1 over tau, where tau is equal to i beta over 2 pi. I'll probably just stick, I'll mostly just stick to the um, zero angular potential, but um, a lot of what I'll say uh, can, be, can be generalized to this case too. Yes, that's right. It was in, uh, the comment is that it was important that space was compact and the spectrum was discrete. And um, well, you can always you can always reslice a path integral. But I think there's a sense in which this is still true. Uh, it could diverge, and you might have to regulate it. If we want this to literally be just a finite sum that you can just do, it's equal to the path integral, then I think it's important that it's compact. Other questions? So our next goal is to turn uh, this statement about the partition function into a statement about the spectrum of operators. I'll quickly review the state operator correspondence that is applies in this example. Has this already been covered, actually, this week in some detail, state operator? OK, so I'm going to go pretty quick. Um, I just want to kind of lay out the notation for the two-dimensional case, and then we'll jump to the answer. 
OK, so on the plane, we have metric dz, dz bar uh, with conformal symmetries, which are holomorphic coordinate changes. Uh, z goes to w of z, z bar goes to w bar of z bar. In particular, the scale transformation is z goes to lambda z, z bar goes to lambda bar z bar, um, which correspond to charges, which have corresponding generators or scale charges L0 and L0 bar. So L0 is the holomorphic rescaling, L0 bar is the rescaling of z bar. The dilatation. is L0 plus L0 bar. So this is the one where we just rescale the, the plane, R2. Um, so the corresponding eigenvalues will be the sum of L0 eigenvalues and L0 bar. In the state operator con correspondence, we map to the cylinder. By z equal to the minus e to the minus I w with w. Well, we can see from this transformation that if things are um, defined on the z plane and single valued as we go around the unit circle, then that corresponds to having w identified mod 2 pi. So that just takes us around the circle. So this will take the z plane with concentric circles around the origin and map it to the W cylinder. Um, so the circles on the cylinder are mapped to the circles on the W, uh, in the W coordinate, where what I'm drawing here is uh, the real part of W, which is identified with a circle, and the imaginary part of W, which is um, just the real line. The scale transformation in the W coordinate uh, is now W goes to W plus IA, W bar goes to W bar minus IA bar. Depending on whether we're in Euclidean signature or Lorentzian signature, we should really be thinking of z and w, um, or sorry, z and z bar, or w and w bar, uh, as independent numbers or as complex conjugates of each other. So in Euclidean signature, um, where the metric uh, ds squared is dw, dw bar is d tau squared plus d theta squared. Uh, we should think of w as theta plus i tau and w bar as theta minus i tau. In Lorentzian, we want the metric to be minus dt squared plus d theta squared. So we think of w as theta minus t and w bar as theta plus t. So in one case, we have one complex coordinate and its complex conjugate. In another case, w and w bar are just two independent real coordinates. So this is the same sort of thing you see with the cross ratios in higher dimensional correlators.
when we talk about the energy or the Hamiltonian of the theory, we're talking about the energy or the Hamiltonian on the cylinder. You can, you can think entirely on the plane if you want to, but it's usually safer to think of, to think on the, to think of the theory uh, as physically defined on the cylinder. Uh, because that way you can take a state on S1 and you can just evolve it as a state living on S1. So in the theory on the cylinder, the energy is defined in the usual way. E is 1 over 2 pi times the integral d theta from 0 to 2 pi t sil tau tau of theta tau It's conserved, so we might as well calculate it at tau equals 0. So I won't go through the calculation, but um, you know, these, these scale charges, L0 and L0 bar, are the zero modes of the stress tensor. And um, here we have the stress tensor appearing. So we expect the Hamiltonian to basically be L0 plus L0 bar. That's not quite true because of the conformal mapping from the plane to the cylinder. And you can find in all the standard books uh, the Schwarzian term gives you a correction to this, which is minus c over 12, which I'm not going to derive. But um, the thing to remember, so this came from the Schwarzian in the, in the transformation of the cylinder. So the thing to remember is that energies and conformal dimensions, scaling dimensions, delta, uh, are related by E equals delta minus C over 12. So when I talk about the energy of a state, I'm always thinking of the, th the theory on the circle that's um, going to be evolved into the theory on the cylinder. Similarly, the angular momentum is J equal to L0 minus L0 bar. Yes. I always assume C left is equal to C right. So now we want to turn this into a statement about the partition function. Uh, or, or rather, we want to restate the partition function in terms of the operators. For that, we need state operator. So first of all, in any quantum field theory, there's a Q here, not assuming conformal invariance. In any quantum field theory, a local operator O of x gives you a state on S1. Uh, might as well set L to 2 pi on S1 circumference 2 pi. That state uh, is defined by just doing the path integral with the operator inserted at the origin. So this is a path integral on the unit disk with O of 0 at the origin. Um, that is, in sort of pictorial path integral language, integral d phi of r theta over the disk r less than 1, e to minus s Euclidean of phi, o of phi of 0.
<laughs> okay, this is this equation is a, is a precise. There's a precise statement behind this equation. This isn't exactly standard notation, so let me explain exactly what I mean by this. You know, on the left-hand side we have a quantum state. Oh, not a number. On the right-hand side we have an integral. Uh, but really, the right-hand side is a formal is a formal object because you can't just do this path integral. I haven't told you the boundary conditions at the edge of the unit disk. So this is like a, you should think of this right-hand side as a functional. To turn this into a number, you have to tell me the boundary conditions at the edge of the unit disk, and that'll turn this into a number. Similarly, a quantum state is a functional that turns field data into numbers. Okay, so I, so I mean this in a precise way that the left-hand side as a linear functional on data at the edge of the, at the boundary of the unit disk is this linear functional on that data defined by uh, the path integral. So that is the wave function of this state, psi sub O of phi naught, which is always defined as the overlap of that state with some field data it's, is chosen up to a normalization to be the path integral that I just wrote, where now we impose the boundary condition phi at r equals 1 as a function of theta is equal to phi naught of theta. So that was in any quantum field theory. You can always do Euclidean path integrals to define states. And if you insert some operators into those path integrals, you can define some excited states. So this, so far, is not a fact about conformal symmetry. What's powerful about conformal symmetry is that it allows you to invert this. That is a state on S1 of size 2 pi can be used to define a local operator. You know, this, going from local operator to states, that's easy. Any, quantum, any old quantum field theory can do that. It's the, in, it's the converse that's hard. And uh, the reason is that in a CFT, you can take a state on the unit circle, and then you can scale that circle down to the origin and turn it into something local. So it's the scale symmetry that uh, gives you this inverse statement. So in principle, you just say you could just say that for SFP, you don't need a formal form of thing, just scale, right? I think that's true. In two dimensions, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's true. Yeah, it's not a unitary evolution. So, I mean, if it were unitary evolution, then we'd always have this one-to-one. -one, but it's not unitary, so I would I would think that you would lose stuff by that. I mean, that it, that wouldn't give you a one-to-one. -one. You'd, you'd be almost guaranteed not to get a one-to-one. -one, I would think. I'm not sure what happens though. Do that. Okay, so in CFT, it's one-to-one. -one. Uh, states or operators give us states, states give us operators. Um, so uh, going back to the partition function, that means we can write z of beta as the sum over h, h bar, e to the minus beta, h plus h bar. Which is the, this, remember that the sum of these is the scaling dimension, uh, but because of the Schwarzian term, there's a minus c over 12. I'm going to put a density of states in here, rho of hh bar, 
so that now what we're summing over is the spectrum of local operators. Now, Virasoro symmetry uh, gives you a lot more structure than, I've, than what I've written here. Um, so this was the sum of, this was the spectrum of all local operators. I haven't even organized things under the conformal algebra yet. Actually, um, for our discussion of the partition function, we won't need that. Um, so I'll just mention that Virasoro gives you, turns this sum into a sum over primaries of chi HH bar of beta, uh, where chi is a character of the Virasor algebra. Um, so this just sums up, um, for a given primary, just sums up the contribution of all the descendant states. Uh, this is essential if you want to do detailed modular bootstrap. Uh, for our purposes, uh, actually, it's going to be enough just to talk about, just to talk about the sum over all, all states and not to organize into Virasoro. But this is secretly hiding underneath. So these characters are just like the conformal blocks of the torus zero point function. OK, so this was all pretty much um, set up. Are there any questions? We're going to talk now about solving crossing and uh, the density of states. So there are there any questions so far before we go on to that? OK. So the first thing I want to drive um, now is the Cardi formula. The Cardi formula is crossing in the high temperature limit. So the high temperature limit is beta to 0. And we want to calculate z of beta, trace e to the minus beta h, in this limit. Well, from the way this is written, it's clear that as we take, well, just from physics, it's clear that if we take very high temperatures, then what's going to matter is very high energies. Or if you, stare, if you look here, then clearly as we take beta to 0, uh, this sum is going to be dominated by the very large number of states at very high energies, which are now just barely suppressed. So this is going to be a statement about the asymptotics. But using modular invariance, we can map it to a statement about low energies. So modular invariance maps beta to 4 pi squared over beta. Uh, this statement was exact. But now we're talking about the very low temperature limit of the partition function. Well, that's easy. We know what state, we, know what state, uh, we land on in the canonical ensemble if we, take to the te if we take the temperature to 0. We're just going to land on the ground state. So this is just going to be e to the minus 4 pi squared over beta. times the energy of the vacuum state. And the vacuum state has h, has scaling weights equal to 0. So the vacuum state under state operator corresponds to the identity operator. So evac is equal to minus c over 12, which is for that reason, called the Casimir energy on the circle. So 
So the conclusion is that log z is approximately equal to 4 pi squared over beta times c over 12 as beta goes to 0. This formula is called the Cardi formula. So it was derived by Cardi a long time ago. Um, it's fixed. So a couple things to note about this. One is that um, it's fixed by dimensional analysis. up to the coefficient. So the free energy of uh, CFT in d dimensions uh, has to scale with a volume L to the d minus 1. And um, if you put back in the Ls here, this is the only thing that works. Maybe I'll write how this goes. So the free energy goes as volume so log z which is like beta times the free energy um, goes as r to the d minus 1, where r is the size of the system. I guess I should call that L, because I've been calling it L. And the only way to make the units work is to make it also go as t to the d minus 1. If you plug in d equals 2, then you find that in conformal theories in two dimensions, uh, the log z has to go like 1 over beta. Uh, and that's exactly what we found. So what Cardi did is he used modular invariance to extract that coefficient. It tells you about the asymptotic um, properties of the partition function. And it also tells you, by the usual thermodynamics arguments, about the asymptotic density of states. So the entropy is given by the thermodynamic formula, 1 minus beta d beta log z, which you can plug in here. It's 2 pi squared over 3 times c over beta, where I'll write again to remind us that these are all statements, these are all asymptotic statements. So this is a statement about beta goes to 0. In the microcanonical ensemble, that is, if we calculate the energy at temperature beta to be minus d beta log z, um, then we can write this energy as a function of beta. And we can plug back in uh, to this formula for the entropy and reinterpret it as a, as a formula for S of E. So we just solve this, plug it back in there. And what you get when you do that is S of E uh, is given by approximately 2 pi root c over 3 E. All these formulas were at beta goes to 0. So when we write them in terms of energy, there are formulas for, as, for, for the entropy as energy goes to infinity. That is, the operator spectrum rho of delta goes like exponential 2 pi root c over 3 times delta. As delta goes to infinity. In particular, uh, this formula applies for delta much, much bigger than c. So we're supposed to be taking delta to infinity with everything else held fixed.
So some comments about what we just did. So I've phrased this. I've phrased this, I phrased this in terms of thermodynamics, right? Like here, I used what this is like a undergraduate thermodynamics formula, one minus beta to beta log z. But the whole point of thermodynamics is that it solves saddle point equations for you. So what I've really done is I've solved the bootstrap uh, by a saddle point approximation. So that is, uh, we just solved. The bootstrap equation, sum over delta, rho of delta, e to the minus beta, delta minus c over 12, is approximately e to the 4 pi squared over beta, c over 12, as beta goes to 0. So we've just solved this equation for rho. Now, this is just like what we do in uh, the bootstrap for correlation functions. We write some formula um, that relates UV and IR. We take some limit, um, say in the light cone bootstrap that Jared was talking about. We take some limit where one side of the equation is dominated by some particular operator. In this case, uh, this side is just given by the vacuum state. And that one particular operator has a very singular form to it. So this is beta goes to 0. This is e to the 1 over, this is e to the 1 over beta as beta goes to 0. So this is a singular term in one channel, and we're using it to reproduce the asymptotics in the other channel. We phrased it as saddle point equation, or you can think of it as thermodynamics. Either way, um, it doesn't matter. So uh, there's a very direct analogy between thermodynamics and the sorts of things we do in analytic bootstrap. To be very explicit, let's compare this to what Jared was talking about an hour ago, where we do the light cone bootstrap in higher dimensions. There, uh, we took the equation g of z, z bar is equal to g of 1 minus z 1 minus z bar. We took some limit. So we took z bar to 0, z to 1. In that limit, one side of this equation was given by a single operator, z bar to the minus delta. And the other side was some asymptotic sum, which had the form sum over L, C of L, K0 of 2L root Z bar. And then the calculation that Jared did uh, was to solve for C of L. So he used the asymptotics on this side to reproduce the singular term on this side. I guess I've switched, I've switched left and right here, but it's exactly the same uh, procedure. So uh, this analogy is pretty general. Um, and if you really understand the Cardi formula, um, then you're a long way towards understanding everything we can do in, in analytic bootstrap as well. So, this, so a, a lot of what we do in light cone bootstrap, this also applies to holographic cases where you, can, where you actually have a lot more power from the OPE. Um, a lot of what we can do there is some very souped up version of the Cardi formula, which had a, had a two line derivation in terms of thermodynamics. Now over here, uh, you don't get all the terms you want just by using a saddle point. You have to, you have to be a little more careful with, with inverting this sum over Bessel functions if you want to get all the important terms. Uh, but the logic is very similar. You're trying to invert these equations where you have singularities on one side and asymptotics on the other. The other thing to notice is the key role of the identity operator. Um, which in this context just means the vacuum state, 0. So by, by state operator, uh, the vacuum state is the state on the right that's determining the asymptotics on the left. 
Um, and it really is playing a key role, both in the light cone bootstrap and in the Cardi formula. Um, this is going to be even more true in the holographic case. So uh, this was all, this whole, this arrow applies to everything that I said about the Cardi formula. So everything we said about the Cardi formula applies to all unitary compact 2D CFTs. This was, this, was so, this was so universal as to not really have anything clearly to do with holography. This will be true of theories that are completely non-holographic. Um, but just like what Jared was talking about with the light cone bootstrap, um, you, know, you expect any CFT to get the long distance physics right. Here, you expect any CFT, well, what we've shown is that any CFT gets a very high energy physics right. We're, we haven't compared to gravity yet, but we're going to compare to gravity and see that this is the right answer based on black hole entropy. To get the answer right at intermediate energies takes more work, and that's where um, the problem of identifying exactly which theories are holographic starts to come into play and figuring out what it really means um, to have um, a CFT with a gravity dual, and that's where we'll come into the, this discussion of sparseness, but we haven't gotten there yet. At this point, we're really just talking about general features of any two-dimensional CFT. So under state operator, um, the identity operator is mapped to the vacuum state. That's all I meant. The number one, that's right. Um, so it's important that we have unitary compact theories. I, what, I'm, what I'm really saying here is that we have to have a unitary theory with a normalizable ground state. And um, in that case, I think this is general. Yeah, I don't think there's any. I think, in, I think it's completely general for, for ordinary CFTs. Um, I guess I'm out of time, so I'll take another question. And Can you use unitary for anything besides the, the vacuum state being uh, normalizable? Um, well, we used it to say that the lowest energy state was the vacuum. As long as you have a, a Hamiltonian that's bounded from below, uh, everything I said would basically be true, except instead of having minus C over 12 here, you would just have E vac. Okay, so it would still apply to, say, non-unitary minimal models if, if it's, I think it's bounded below in that case. Sorry, the, I, did, I forgot to say the question. The question was whether we used really, how much we really used unitarity. The answer was that we just had to have a vacuum state with lowest energy. Another question? Um, okay, so the question is if, there's, if there can be vacuum degeneracy um, in two dimensions. I don't know. Reasonable theories like that. We could easily put in a degeneracy into this formula um, just by having a log of the number of vacuum states, but I guess I'm... I guess I'm really assuming that there's a unique vacuum here. It would be subliving in any way, unless it flows. Yeah, yeah. Any more questions? So if not, let's thank Thomas. <laughs>